food, clothes, medicines that come from uh, plants and other raw materials that we use in everyday life. Now, this makes plants to be very important in uh, a world biological diversity. Also, they are also important for the economic uh, resources that we get from them. But uh, we are going to focus our talk today on medicinal plants. Now, we know that medicinal plants have been with us for a very long time, as long as we have been alive. And uh, medicinal plants that have been used to treat a range of diseases, so many diseases. In fact, uh, it is estimated that uh, worldwide there are around, there are known 50,000 uh, higher medicinal plants species. And this makes around 20% of the world, of the world vascular flora, which uh, uh, constitutes the biggest spectrum of biodiversity that is used for man for specific uh, diseases. Now, traditionally, we have uh, around the globe, we have different uh, societies that depend on the use of medicinal plants uh, for their med medicine. Uh, in particular here, we have in China where we have the tradition Chinese medicine, which is largely 80% of plant-based. And this, uh, percent of the total medicinal consumption in China and in the rural areas it constitutes around 90 percent of the total medicinal consumption so you can see the importance of medicinal plants uh, in these societies we also have in India where we have the Ayurvedic medicine which is basically based on uh, around 2,000 different plant species and then uh, when we come to sub-Saharan Africa and where we, we are found, we can see the need of medicinal plants is very important, where be, whereby we have that, we, we can see the deficiencies in contemporary medicine. For example, if you look at the ratio for, uh, in, in sub-Saharan Africa, for every one doctor is responsible for 40, around 40,000 patients compared to the traditional herbalist, where one herbalist is responsible, takes care of around 500 patients. So it is very difficult to walk into a herbalist uh, where they practice and uh, go away without being attended to. But this, in, uh, when you go to hospitals, you can walk into an hospital and come out without being attended because of the efficiency in our uh, inadequacy in our human resource. And then uh, another problems that uh, we, we see in the developing world is even the, uh, the drugs that are used in hospitals are very inadequate. Like for example, we see that for the total world con uh, consumption of pharmaceutical drugs, only 15% end up in the development, uh, developing world. This is not forgetting that in developing, it is in the developing countries where we have the populations rapidly growing, and this is likely to put a lot of pressure even in the medicinal plant resources that are being used. So we need to do something to even conserve these medicinal plants because of the deficiency that we have in our medis, medi, me, me, medical uh, uh, facilities. Now, uh, from the Bible, when you look at the Bible, you see that in the Garden of Eden, God are directing Adams that have given you dominance over all things. Use fruits as food and uh, leaves as medicine. So we, we see that the use of medicinal plants has been with us for a very long time. But then it is known, it's not known exactly when and where the first plants, uh, people starting using these plants. So it is assumed that maybe uh, it could have been due to accidental discovery whereby people were feeding on some of these plants and it was found that it was uh, 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 helping in easing, easing, easing pains or treating certain diseases that people started uh, using medicinal plants. But however, we can see from archeological findings that spans over 60,000 years ago, we can see that uh, when the corpses that were buried so many years ago were analyzed, 
the pollens that were found were realized that were of medicinal value. So maybe the use of medicinal plants was being used at that time, maybe for treating these people before they passed on or for conserving the, the bodies. We can also look at the, uh, uh, the early records, the, super, the old Sumerian clay tablets, which has got a lot of plant remedies record, recorded in them. Also, when you look at the Egyptian civilization, we also see a lot of medicinal plant uh, that, uh, information that is in them. Again, you come to China, uh, when you look at the records that were published over 1600 years ago, there are a lot of herbal cures that are attributed to, uh, to the work of the empire who lived around 4,500 years ago. So you can see that medicinal plants, uh, the use of medicinal plants in the treating of uh, several elements have been embraced by different societies around the globe. In India, we have the Rig Veda, which is the basis of uh, Ayurvedic medicine. And again, here you see a lot of useful information about the use of medicinal plants in the treatment of various elements. Now, the foundation of Western medicine. We found that the foundation of Western medicine can be traced on the use of medicinal plants worldwide. So herbal medicine have been used and you can look at this in ancient Greek where we have a lot of uh, this, uh, where the foundation of Western medicine uh, can be traced from. And then we also have the Greek physician, the Hippocrates, that uh, is also known as the father of medicine, uh, that uh, uh, this guy used a lot of uh, herbal remedies in the treatment of various medicine. And then when also you look at the Dimesia Medica, this is a a publication that uh, has been existing for a very long time. You find over 600 species of plants recorded in it. There is also uh, a talk about doctrine of signatures, whereby it was believed that uh, herbs resembling various parts of the body were being used to treat elements of those body parts. Like for example, if you had grains that look like uh, the kidney of a human being, then it was assumed that you could use this grain to treat uh, that part of the, of the human anatomy. So these ones were some of the things that people believed that directed us into using some of the plants to treat various elements. However, this the doctrine of signatures was later disputed and uh, found that it was not true. Then uh, the discovery about uh, more work on the medicinal plants uh, went to 18th century, where we saw another, uh, a lot of progress made in science. And uh, we saw uh, the traditional practitioners of herbal medicine and regular physicians coming together and trying to work together. Path to modern medicine. So we we know that many herbal remedies uh, have got around a lot of a uh, very good sound of scientific basis, where they have been used to uh, even to come up with the drugs, the prescription drugs that are used, and uh, this again can be traced in the work of William Withering, which was uh, the first person to scientifically investigate a folk remedy. And then in the 19th century, the history tells us that uh, scientists began purifying the active extract from medicinal plant just to find out those uh, particular chemicals, specific chemicals that were responsible and or that were, could be used for the treatment of various uh, elements. And this, was spans as early as 1806 when uh, opium uh, poppy was discovered. In the 20th, 20th century, we have uh, where the direct use of plant extract continue to decrease in the late 19th to 20th century. And uh, 
Today, even today, medicinal plants contribute a lot to the prescription medicine. In fact, we are told that 25% of those drugs that are prescribed in the United States are from plants. And when you add the fungal products, which also have got a lot of medicinal uh, components, then we realize that 50% of those uh, uh, prescribed drugs in the United States are basically from uh, plants. And uh, the use of herbal medicine, uh, we also, the statistics say that 75 to 90% of the rural population uh, in the developing nation rely on herbal medicine. In fact, if you look at the book uh, publication by Kokwaro, we are told that uh, 60 to 80% of indigenous Africans uh, still depend on uh, traditional or medicinal plants for their primary health care. And this, if you look at the East African country community where we have Kenya, Uganda, and Tanzania, we have over 12,000 different plant species that are being used. And that this is coupled by their, the rich ethnic diversity of around 180 tribes found in that region. Then you can see that we have a lot of uh, information that can be harnessed on medicinal plants. So from there, there have been a lot of interest on medicinal plants. And in there, we have some communities that have incorporated the use of traditional medicine into their modern healthcare. In question, in a, uh, an example here is the Republic of China, where we have the traditional Chinese medicine having been incorporated into the Chinese modern healthcare. And this, they are used as a blend for uh, taking care of various elements. In India, again, we have the traditional system that is separate from Western medicine. So it, uh, we have a diverse uh, solution when somebody is sick where you can choose whether traditional system or Western medicine for your, uh, for your treatment. So in India, where you have the Ayurvedic medicine, we have the Hindu, that comes from Hindu origin, Yunani medicine from Muslim and Greek origin. And then this also contribute a lot to economic uh, resources for this, those particular communities. So as a result, there's a lot of interest in medicinal plants. And this medicinal, this interest has focused on the indigenous people in many parts of the world. And uh, currently we have a lot of scientists, ethnobotanists trying to spend a lot of time with this herbalist to try to record some of the knowledge, ethnobotanical uh, knowledge on these particular uh, resources. Now, however, we have a lot of challenges that still exist that is affecting the use of medicinal plants and these challenges, one, the most important is over exploitation. Okay? We have exploitation pressure that have increased with increasing human population growth. And then also, uh, so the over exploitation is likely to lead to loss of vital components that are necessary for. Uh, for the uh, continual use of these medicinal plants. Now, the disadvantage of these challenges is that widespread destruction threatened to eliminate thousands of species that have never been scientifically investigated for medicinal plants. As I said earlier, only around 50,000 medicinal plants, higher plants are known worldwide to be having medicinal value meaning that there are so many medicinal plants that have not been studied. So when we uh, destroy our environments, then we are likely to destroy some of these plants that have never been studied. And basically nobody will know what they really, uh, the, their medicinal potential. Then also another problem that is there is that erosion of tribal cultures, tribal cultures. Uh, there are a lot of, uh, 
most modernity has come with uh, a lot of things whereby people tend to run away from our cultural values. And so when we run away from our cultural values, then it means that that knowledge, the ethnobotanical knowledge that existed cannot be transferred to the younger generation who consider those uh, kind of knowledge as primitive. So there is a threat that uh, comes with that and we are likely to lose this important information about the use of our medicinal plants. And that is uh, not forgetting that those people who have this knowledge on medicinal plants are old and some of them are dying. So we are likely to lose this uh, uh, knowledge. So that calls for a proper strategy, strategies that need to be developed on the conservation of these medicinal plants. So we need to develop uh, proper strategies uh, so that we can discuss, the, uh, we can uh, conserve this knowledge. That is besides uh, recording the ethnobotanical knowledge, we also need to look for ways in which we can conserve or preserve some of these important plants. And I have two, uh, I'm looking at integrated approach, balancing in situ and ex situ conservation. Now, uh, in again, in conservation of these med medicinal plants, we have a lot, a number of uh, stakeholders that need to be involved. So we have so many stakeholders that play vital roles in the conservation of uh, the knowledge, uh, medic our medicinal plants, so that we ensure that these plants do not disappear. So we have agronomists, and horticulturalists, we have conservation campaigners, ecologists, eco, uh, ethnobotanists, all these uh, uh, stakeholders are important when it comes to uh, conserving our medicinal plants. Again, going back to the conservation in situ conservation, for those who may not be aware, this is whereby we plant, we can uh, plant more of these plants in already uh, existing forest uh, in the wild. So we just plant and make sure that those plants that are, uh, are threatened are planted and we have many of them. We can set aside uh, nature reserves and national parks uh, where we call them the protected areas and plants, uh, some of these plants uh, to act as conservation zone. We also have ex situ conservation whereby we, uh, we can uh, uh, set aside gardens, maybe our botanical gardens or our lands, and domesticate these plants within uh, our reach. Now, the disadvantage of uh, ex situ conservation is that there is a narrow range of genetic variation. So when you remove these plants from their, the wild, and bring them to uh, maybe your botanical garden, then you'll have a narrow range of genetic variation. Also, they, they may suffer genetic erosion, erosion uh, whereby these plants will depend on the human care for uh, a long, long time, as opposed to uh, the plants when they are in the wild. This is just an image of uh, ex situ conservation where we plant this, uh, we identify the medicinal plants and plant them within our gardens uh, where we can easily reach them. Now, uh, leaving that history aside, we know that medicinal plants have been used for treating various elements for a very long time. But then what makes these medicinal plants to be important in the treatment of various uh, diseases. We have realized that the medicinal plants are the richest bioresource that is known. We have our drugs that come from them, uh, both traditional and modern medicine. We can also get nutraceuticals from these medicinal plants. These medi medical medicinal plants also can, uh, can, uh, can, we can get food supplements from them and also we have folk medicine that come from them. Now, this is where we come in the phytochemical work. 
phytochemical is simply the chemistry of plants, whereby after realizing that this plant can be used for a specific purpose, the treatment of a specific disease, then we come back into our labs, collect this plant and try to find out what chemicals are found in this particular plants. We have a number of natural bioactive compounds. These are just chemicals that are found in the plants that are important in the treatment of various elements. So it is the work of a scientist to identify these natural bioactive compounds, uh, try to extract them from these plants, and then use them either for uh, drug synthesis and uh, come up with new, totally new drugs from these medicinal plants. So we, re we realized that uh, from fruits, flowers, stem, leaf root, virtually all parts of the plants are rich on natural bioactive compounds. And these are the compounds that help in providing definite physiological action on human body when someone is sick. Uh, this, again, these natural bioactive compounds have got application, as I said, in human therapy, in veterinary medicine, in agriculture, scientific research, and other areas that we can look at. Uh, this is just an image of a flowchart of what happened in the phytochemistry work, where the plant is collected, what are called plant material, and then it is extracted. This is the extraction of uh, chemicals that are found in these plants. Then we have purification, so as just to get the purified compounds that can be found in these plants. Then we qualify, we, we qualify and quantify them. We do all those analysis and all these other processes to try to identify what is important, uh, what important bioactive compound that is in that plant. For the sake of this talk, uh, because of the nature or diversity of the audience, I will avoid to go into details of the phytochemical work. But just to brush uh, through very fast is that at phytochemistry, what we do is that once we have identified a plant to be important in the treatment of any specific disease, we normally uh, collect that, uh, that plant you collect the part that is used uh, for treating that particular disease and make sure that that plant is positively identified by the, tax, by the taxonomist so that you ensure you are working on the right plant that you intended to work on. Then after that, it goes through a sample preparation where we have grind, uh, the plant is cut into smaller pieces then it is dried under shade and you have to dry it under shade to prevent the direct sunlight from accessing your plant. This is because the UV rays has got a way of altering the chemical compounds within the plant. Then after drying, of course, you grind and then you take your plant through extraction. We have different methods of extraction depending on your interest on that plant and what chemical compounds you have, you want to extract from that plant. Because different chemical compounds have got different uh, proper chemical properties. So they react differently to different uh, solvents that you are going to use. We have both inorganic solvents and organic solvents. Inorganic solvents, I am sure you know, is water, where you use water to extract your uh, bioactive uh, compounds. And then we have organic, ext ex organic extraction where we have a range of uh, solvents, organic solvents that are used. And remember, every organic solvent also, also have got different properties, chemical properties. So they don't, uh, they, they, they also have, they are limited in the extraction. So you have to, identi to identify the correct solvents that you are going to use for your analysis. Then depending on what you are interested in that plant, you can go to the phytochemical screening where you screen all the bioactive 
compounds and then them, and then you do quantitative and qualitative analysis and all that. And at the same time, if you want to go the, the medical way where you take your plant extract and test it against the disease causing microbe to see how active it is. And the process goes until you reach a point where you use the lab animals for testing, where you use the, the, the apes until you, do, you test your drugs and come up with a drug from the process. So basically, that is, uh, in a snapshot, that is what we do at the phytochemistry. And uh, I was avoiding that part because of the diversity of the audience uh, for this talk. I talk of extraction as a vitrol uh, PEP in our phytochemical work. And this is where we want, we, we do separation of medicinally active portion of plant tissue using selected solvents through, use, through standard procedures. And the basic parameters uh, that influence the quality of extract are the plant part that you are going to use, whether you are going to use the bark, the root, the flower, and so on and so forth. So that uh, will influence the extract that you'll end up with. Then again, as I said, solvent is very uh, important, selection of solvent. So if you select a wrong solvent, you choose a wrong solvent, then you are not uh, likely to end up with the extract that you need. Then uh, extraction procedure is very important during your extraction process. And uh, in case of solvents, there are those factors that you have to look at. The toxicity, you have to ensure that the solvent that you are, you have, you are using is not toxic. Uh, you have to ensure that the solvent that you have chosen to work on has got ease of evaporation, uh, evaporation can evaporate easily, that's what I mean. And then you also have to ensure that uh, the solvent you are using can promote, has ability to promote rapid physiological absorption, can absorb the extract in question, that specific extract that you want uh, to, ex to get from that plant. And then also you look at the preservative action. Then uh, factors affecting choice of solvents, quantity of phytochemical to be extracted. So for like for phytochemical work, you need a good quantity of the extract. So you have to use that solvent that will give you good, good quantity. Then also you need to choose a solvent, organic solvent uh, or whatever, or inorganic solvent that will have a high rate of extraction. It is also important to have a solvent that will give you diversity of different inhibitory compounds. Uh, you get a lot of extra compound, you can extract a lot of compounds. Then ease of subsequent handling of the extract, don't choose as an extract that cause a lot of health risk. Like for example, we have an extract called benzene. Benzene is very risky and it is carcinogenic. So in most cases where you can avoid such extra, uh, solvents, avoid them. Only choose a solvent that is safe for you. Then toxicity of the solvent in bioassay process. In case you are going to use the microbial analysis, then you need to choose a solvent that is not going to be, uh, to be toxic to your microbes when you'll be doing your analysis. Again, potential health hazard of the extractants is also important. So ladies and gentlemen, these are some of the solvents that we use and what they are able to extract from your plant. You can see water, what water can extract, what ethanol can extract, what methanol ex can extract, chloroform, ether, and acetone. So for example, if my interest in a specific plant was to extract phenol and flavonoid, and then also maybe to extract saponin and all that, then it will be uneconomical to choose acetone because acetone, for example, will only give you two, uh, will, can only 
extract two bioactive uh, compounds, that is phenols and flavanols. So it will be better to choose methanol that can give you a range. So this is what uh, I meant when I say that uh, you need to ensure that you have uh, chosen the right solvent for your phytochemical work. Now, uh, as I said earlier that I was avoiding the chemistry part, the hard chemistry part, uh, I've, I have here a number of pictorial presentation of some of the medicinal plants that we, we interact with on our uh, everyday. The first uh, medicinal plant here that maybe perhaps most of you didn't know is medicinal, is a blackjack. Blackjack, this is a weed that we meet every day, but then it is of high medicinal value. For example, it is antibacterial, it is antioxidant, anti-inflammatory, anti-parasitic, and anti-cancer. This is because it is rich in a number of bioactive compounds that help in the management of this particular elements. And the elements here are ulcers, digestive disorder, memory loss, and so on and so forth. The next one is hibiscus, hibiscus plants, that is also, again, very important in uh, elements such as hypertension, pyrexia, and liver disorder. We have uh, stevia. This is another plant that is very important uh, for it's a calorie free natural sweetener, uh, very important in, for those who are uh, diabetic. It is antifungal and antibacterial. Then we have Artemisia annua. Artemisia annua, we have uh, anti malarial drugs that have been synthesized from this particular plant. So it is anti malarial, it can be used for eye infection. Uh, it can be used for other, even uh, boosting our immune systems. Then we have the aloe plants that are also important in wound healing, anti-dandruffs, uh, cosmetic preparation, and also it's a source of amino acids. The next plant here is African marigold which has been found to be very important in eye care. Then rosemary, I think all of us, we have met this rosemary plant, which is used for flavoring our food. It is known as uh, it is uh, antidepressant and recommended to, to overcome problems of pre premature baldness, especially in men. We have lemongrass. Lemongrass also have a number of uh, therapeutic uh, advantage that is uh, listed. Then we have another plant, lemon verbena, also very important. And then we have the sage, the salvia officinalis, which is uh, uh, have a lot of uh, medicinal value besides being a biodiesel. Then we have white eucalyptus. We know we have this one from our homes. This is also a very good antimicrobial and biopesticide. Uh, bio so you can use it as a biopesticide or you can use it as antimicrobial plant. Then we have lemon uh, eucalyptus, which also have a lot of uh, medicinal uh, properties. The senna plant, this also we found in a, a lot, we found it in uh, natural vegetations, also very important in uh, as a medicinal plant. Then we have uh, this is uh, Jatropha carcass. Jatropha carcass has been used as biofuel, uh, besides other medicinal value. Its oil is also highly insecticide. So thank you very much. That is the end of my presentation. And I will give room for questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter Angolo.
That was very interesting. At least I've learned some facts about medicinal plants. Now, uh, I'll kindly request participants to raise their questions. I'll be unmuting you and giving you a chance to voice your questions. But you can also uh, type in your questions in the chat room. I can see there's one, there's one already from Mugwima Njuguna. Where can one get um, Artemisia for planting in a small home garden? Oh, where can one get Artemisia for planting in small home gardens? Now, uh, I'm sure that uh, I don't exactly know where you can get Artemisia seedlings, but uh, maybe uh, in a museum we have uh, a section that deals with uh, seeds. Maybe you can try to consult uh, National Museum, the PCP lab. You might be able to be. They might be. They will be able to give you some uh, direction on how to get the Artemisia seedlings. I see another hand up from Helida Oyeke. I'm trying to unmute. Helida, you're not unmuted. Yes. I've, I've done so. Thank you so much, uh, Peter, for that interesting talk and uh, very educative. I just wanted to find out there's been this talk that um, um, growing these medicinal plants outside their natural environment uh, kind of um, interferes with their efficacy. Has this been tested scientifically? And if so, you know, how can we make sure that when we grow them ex situ, we shall be able to retain the efficacy? Thank you. Um, Dr. Harry, that is true. Uh, not that they lose, they lose their efficacy. They don't lose their efficacy. It's only that we have the geographical settings that contributes also to the uh, to the bioactive nutrients in some of these plants. When you have these plants grown within your botanical garden or between you, within your garden, then what you have done is that you have narrow a range of their genetic variation. So it means that all these plants are only found within a specific, a defined geographical region, but when you go to collect these plants from the wild, then you find them, you can find them from different geographical uh, settings, and that contributes to the amount of these bioactive uh, components in these particular plants, but they do not lose their, you cannot say that because I have planted plant A, in my uh, uh, botany, in my garden, then a uh, compound A will be missing from it. The compound A will be there, but what will differ basically is maybe the amount that you can find in that compound A. Another problem that maybe uh, your growing plants in ex situ might uh, bring is that the plant must, might suffer genetic erosion whereby with the time there will be genetic uh, mutation or genetic variation will be can be found in this particular plant that is grown in the botanic garden because it will have to be you will have to care for it uh, as opposed to when it is in the wild where nobody cares uh, for it so that might also bring a lot of genetic variation in the plant but then that compound that is in that plant might be there. What will vary is the content of that particular compound in the plant. I think uh, I've answered that. Yes, sorry, I did mean to use the word loose. If I use that, I meant to reduce, reducing. The, the, the efficacy is like, it's not as powerful as when it comes from the natural environment. That's what I meant. Yeah, that is true, that is true. Okay. I see there are some questions from Rupi Mangat. Rupi Mangat, you're unmuted kindly, just voice your questions. Thank you. Yes. Um, I want to know how many plant-based medicines are certified in Kenya? 
I mean, traditional plant-based medicines. And um, is it a big challenge it, to have traditional medicine um, certified in the pharmaceutical industry? And the last one is, do we have certified herbalists who we can go to? Thank you. Okay, how many medicinal plants are certified in Kenya? Uh, that is a hard question to answer because we have uh, so many uh, herbalists in Kenya that practice. Some of them are, they have been uh, tested, some of them might not have been tested. But the thing that uh, what uh, I think uh, the government insists on is that before any plant is used for uh, maybe taking care of any elements, then it, is ne it needs to be approved. That might not be ca the case for most uh, herbalists, but then that should be the law. Uh, if you want uh, any of the plants to be certified for, for, for use uh, as medicine, then the first procedure is, is that it has to be tested. We have different places where it can be tested from. We have, Cam uh, we have Camry, where we have a section dealing with the medicinal plants. You can go there and test your plants. Uh, we also do a little bit at the National Museum where we uh, carry out the phytochemical screening just to show you what your plant contain. And then once all these uh, tests have been done, then you are supposed to go to the Ministry of Culture, uh, the Department of Culture for registration. Thank you. Okay, thanks for that uh, response. There's a question from Anthony Odiambo. I've been trying to unmute you, but I, I don't think you're getting the prompt. So, um, the question is, have you done any research on cannabis? As people say, it's full of good medicine properties. Mm -hmm. So as our speaker answers that question, anybody who has raised their hands, I will try to unmute you. So kindly just unmute yourself when I unmute you. Thanks. Thank you, Diambo. Cannabis, cannabis sativa is illegal in Kenya. And so uh, in Kenya, <coughs> not a lot of research have been done because you have to get a lot of authorization to be able to work on cannabis sativa. So. As for now, it remains illegal until that time that uh, they will uh, say that uh, we can uh, do, a, we, uh, they, can, we, they will open legalize it, then a lot of research can be done. In some countries, we know that a lot of research have been done on cannabis sativa, and it is for sure, it has a lot of medicinal potential. Thank you. We have a hand raised, Kelvin Nyewo. Oh, yeah. Yes, I don't know whether you can hear me. I can hear you well. All right. Um, uh, Mr. Angolo, thank you for the presentation. And uh, one thing that is lingering in my mind is how you end up determining the medicinal plant and its application. In this sense, I'm looking at, you know, you have a blackjack. Uh, uh, how do I tell how to use it? Do I apply it? Do I take the leaves uh, and have the extract and drink it? Uh, like, uh, I understand, like, in, uh, from where I stand, there are some plants, uh, when you go to the forest, we were being told by our grandmothers that, just check on the movements of uh, like the elephants or baboons. If they chew a particular plant, then that is the uh, way it should be taken. If it is the roots, that's what you need to take. So in this case, uh, I know the research is still ongoing and we are yet to uh, get everything to details, but how do we go about it? I don't know. Now, uh... For, for, for science, science, uh, science uh, scientific research, we work from the known to the unknown. Now, I talk of ethnobotanical knowledge. Uh, this knowledge is there with uh, our grandmothers, 
with our grandfathers and those traditional herbalists that are already using these plants for the treatment of several ailments. Now, before we carry out any research on phytochemical work on any plant, we rely heavily on this ethnobotanical knowledge. You have to collect uh, information about this plant and basically you have to know what is that herbalist down there, your grandmother or your grandfather is using these plants for. Then from there, you can now uh, pick this plant and build on your research from that. So it is not that we, you, you just uh, pick a plant that uh, you don't know and then try to work on it. We are aware that some of the plants that the herbalists use are toxic or are poisonous. But then we need to find out, we need to collect information from them on how do they ensure that these poisonous plants do not have side effect on, uh, on the patient. For example, when you look at the traditional uh, medicine, you find that it is very difficult to get a herbalist that uses one specific plant for the treat treatment you always find that they mix, they put these different plants together and have a concoction. And it is this concoction that they use for the treatment. The question that you need to ask yourself as a scientist is that when you have one or two, three, you have two or three plants that are mixed together and boiled together, does it mean that all these three plants that have been to put together all of them has got medicinal uh, potential against that particular element that uh, you are taking care of. The answer may be yes or no. From, from our research, we found that the one of the reason why this herbalist makes this plant is that the herbalist is much aware that one of the plant that is going to use for taking care of uh, the, the patient is poisonous. So he introduces another plant in the mix so that this plant, the responsibility of this plant is to reduce the poisonous nature of that plant that is, uh, has got uh, a high medicinal value. So that when the patient takes, the patient will not be uh, uh, if affected uh, uh, due to the poisonous nature. So uh, all this research that we do we move from what is already known to what is not known. Thank you. Okay, thanks. There's also another uh, hand up from Professor Humphrey Ojuang. Kindly just go ahead and voice your question. Uh, okay. Thank you. Uh, my question to the presenter is about uh, I don't know whether he's hearing me. I have challenges from office. Yes, I'm hearing you, Prof. Wonderful. So uh, question one, why do we go to the Ministry of Culture and, not, and uh, I don't know whether it's now called Culture and National Heritage or, or National Heritage and Culture for registration purposes? Why don't we, because you're very scientific, why don't we, for registration purposes, have a uh, Ministry of Health and maybe Cambry and other uh, organizations with scientific basis uh, to certify some of these herbalists? That's number one. Number, number two, uh, we have three different expressions being used interchangeably, namely traditional medicine, uh, complementary medicine, and alternative medicine. Where are we? Thank you. Uh -huh. Thank you, Prof. I'll start with the first question. Why we go to the cultural, the, the Department of Culture for Registration. Now, plants are considered as as one of our, as some of our important, important natural heritage. 
So uh, Department of Culture deals with uh, all those things that are under natural heritage. So that's why when you want to uh, work on this uh, register, a plan to be important for the treatment of a, a disease, then you have to go for uh, to the culture, the Department of Culture. Again, this is uh, about uh, government arrangements. So we may not have a lot of uh, uh, things to say about it, but uh, it's about government and uh, what they consider to be natural heritage and all that. Mm -hmm. And then you have also asked about a traditional medicine, uh, alternative medicine and contemporary, I think, medicine. Complementary. Uh, sorry? Complementary medicine. Complementary. Now, uh, I think alternate, when you talk about uh, traditional medicine, and alternative medicine, you are talking about the same thing. So you, you talk of the same, one, one and the same thing. Uh, complementary medicine, uh, I'm not sure about that, but uh, traditional medicine and uh, alternative medicine, you talk about the same thing. Thank you. Okay, thanks. We also have another question from John and Margaret Cooper. Hello, can you hear us? Yes, we can yeah. hear you very well. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Juan Angolo, for an excellent lecture. It was very clear, even to uh, two Waze like us sitting in cold England. We wish we were in Kenya with you. Um, thank you. We just wanted, <laughs> just wanted to allude to a couple of points that you made in the context of a very limited study we've been doing down near Kuali, where we've encouraged local people uh, to show us medicinal plants. I'm a veterinary pathologist, so of course I'm particularly interested in the in the animal side. But very often the plants they've shown shown us shown us have they've said, "Ah, oh, well you can use this dower. You use it for wounds. You can use it on people. You can use it on nombe. You can use it on boozy, Whatever it happens to be." So the first point is. It was good that you mentioned veterinary and the fact that many of these plants uh, might have products that are of benefit not only to people, but to their, their important livestock. But the second aspect, which uh, I welcomed your mentioning, and my wife and I did because we're both watching, is the fact that so much of the knowledge is in the older people. The, the folks that we deal with in around Kuali are all wase. They're wase like us. We, we go round with them in the bush and we speak English and Swahili to them. But every time they find a plant and tell us its use, they put the words into Kidigo, which is their local language. And so I think the main question about this is, is to say, what account is taken of the fact that not only are the Waze going to disappear, but perhaps the local names, which are all important, even if they're not scientific, they are the ones that mean something to local people. Thank you very much. Now, what we do during our ethnobotanical surveys is that we record, we record the uh, local language of these plants that are used by the local people. And then when we collect at the point of collecting this plant, we do a taxonomic identification so that we can know the local, the language that we were given, we uh, associate it with the scientific name that we get from our taxonomies. So all this information is collected during uh, ethnobotanical survey. But again, I want to agree that uh, perhaps we need to do a lot so that we can also encouraging the young, the youth, the youth also to be part of this particular uh, study so that they can, because the traditional medicine knowledge is transferred orally from the, uh, the practitioners to the youths. But because of the modernity, the civilization, the youths are running away from the, from, from the culture saying that it is a, a kind of a primitive. So we need to do something so that we can all, we can bring back the youth 
to this to embrace the uh, the knowledge. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I also see Annette's Majanja hand up kindly. Just go ahead and voice your question. Hello. Thank you so much for the presentation. Um, my question has been partly answered on the chat, uh, but I, I would really be interested in accessing these resources, like the ethnobotanical information, just because we keep referring to our grandmothers and our grandfathers, and some of us, our grandmothers and our grandfathers are urban dwellers. So it's information that is not something you can go somewhere and ask about. But I know that there's been years and years of people recording stories, and I, I would like to know where to get these stories from, or you know, whatever data, I mean, whatever writing exists um, about, I guess, medicinal plants. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Now, we have uh, scientists that have uh, done that, collected that data. Like, I would uh, prefer you to a publication by Professor John Kokwaro. Uh, I don't know the exact title, but if you just Google that name publication by Professor George Ko John Kokwaro, you'll get uh, a lot of information on ethnobotanical research on this, on the, what we are talking about. Also, you can visit uh, National Museums of Kenya. That is uh, Kendrick, Kendrick section. Also, they have collected some information on this, uh, on this, on this uh, uh, plants. So uh, you, if, you, if, you, if you visit uh, Kendrick, you'll be able to get that information. You can also come to Botany, Botany Department. Uh, also visit us at phytochemistry section. We'll be able to help you where to get this information. Sorry, uh, did you say Ken, Kendrick? Kendrick? Kendrick. Kendrick, Kendrick is that? a section within National Museums of Kenya. K E N K E N R I K. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll also give a chance to Mugwima Njuguna. You had put a question on the chat. Kindly just voice it out. Uh, thank you very much. I hope you can hear me. I have bad internet here. So I'll yes. make it quick. Um, I, I, this is not my field. I'm in the construction field. So you, you'll accept uh, my ignorance. But I would like you to perhaps shed some light on uh, the Loliondo business. We heard about it in Kenya, people going for treatment in Tanzania. Can you tell us which plants, the, if, you, if you are aware of this information, which plant uh, was being used? For, for those curative uh, purposes and perhaps the scientific name. And basically you are, you, your view as a scientist to these matters. And uh, where, where you are at it, you, you may shed some light on uh, the issue of uh, magic and uh, pseudoscience and how it is connected with uh, traditional medicine. Uh, how do we navigate around that? Because we know traditional medicine is important, yet in some places we associate it with magicians, with witchcraft. What, what's your advice on, on this matter? Asante, and thank you very much for your presentation. Okay. Now, starting with the Loliondo, uh, I'd mentioned uh, when, we, when I was answering a question is that uh, the, according to the laws of Kenya, before any plant is used for any treatment, it's declared to be, uh, to be important in the treatment of any particular disease, uh, there's a due process that has to be taken, uh, to, to it, it has to undergo. That in, in include testing and all that. Uh, but Loliondo, I doubt whether the plant in question was either tested and uh, whether the efficacy of this plant was, uh, was tested. Because we all know the results that came as a result of the Loliondo fiasco. Uh, I may not remember the exact plant that they were using, that the, 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 the Mze was using, but uh, what I can say about it is that uh, before any plant is used, it's declared to be fit for use against any disease, then there must be a lot of test that is done on that plant so that it is used uh, for that particular uh, 
for that particular case. We are aware that most of our herbalists uh, maybe have not done the, the said test, but then that is how things are. And then uh, pseudoscience. Uh, uh, about uh, witchcraft and the traditional uh, medicine, pra med medicine practice. Uh, most people believe that uh, when you use, uh, uh, when you go for traditional uh, herbal practice, then you are, uh, uh, you are a witchcraft. That is not the case. A witchcraft is a witchcraft, but a traditional herbalist is uh, basically uh, different from uh, a witchcraft. A witchcraft is somebody will tell you that, oh, I'm seeing things, uh, you are sick because of this, your sickness is because of your uncle or the friend to your friend or all, all that. When you go to a, a traditional herbalist, you will say what you are suffering from and his work will be basically to prescribe a, pl a medicinal plant, give you a concussion to take so that you can get a relief. So all those two are totally different uh, scenarios. So uh, the, 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 the witchcraft, the pseudoscience is not based on any practical aspect. There's no practical science in it, but for traditional uh, herbal, herbal practice, there is science that it is based on scientific findings. Thank you. And maybe Peter, I could just add that the, the Loliondo case, um, him uh, purporting to be a herbalist, herbalists normally don't tell people that the, the plants that they are working with. They'd rather give you a mixture already done or the concoction. So even the Loliondo guy, we, we are still not sure what he was using at the moment, which is common with all um, herbalists. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Ari. Actually, the Luliondo guy was not a herbalist because when I read the story, he said that he dreamt about this plant in the night. Then in the morning, he woke up and started using the plant. So basically, we are not told whether he was a practicing herbalist. Uh, yes, but can I intervene? Can, uh, yeah. Peter, can I, may I intervene, please? Yes, yes. Yes, I, I think uh, I would like to agree with Dr. Yeke there, they are very secretive, very, very secretive. They keep their secrets. They have their oaths of secrecy, which is also done <laughs> in, in so-called modern medicine. They have their Hippocratic oath and the pharmacies also have their oath. So most uh, professions and occupations uh, you have ways of regulating your knowledge systems. Two, uh, I would, I'm not disagreeing with my good friend Peter, uh, but I just want to add information that most herbalists from my part of Kenya or East Africa, the low speaking part of Kenya where I have done some interviews in Homer Bay and in Migori, they tell me that they get revealed knowledge. So you do not just dismiss them and say that because they saw a dream and they saw a plant and in the morning they went and uh, so, uh, picked the plant and it cured some ailment that they are practicing witchcraft, so-called witchcraft. And in fact, the Witchcraft Act of 1920. It's still in our statutes, but when you read it, I think it's obsolete. So it should be revisited and maybe the National Museums of Kenya and my institute at the University of Nairobi, we should look at it and have a conversation over it. So we might dismiss people who are very useful. My mother showed me many many hubs, which I still use today. We have never taken them <laughs> for tests uh, anywhere. My grandmother showed me some. I know them, I know some of them, but I, I have modern ed education. I'm trained in Kenya, I'm trained in South Africa, I'm trained in, in England, and I'm in the humanities and social sciences. 
I teach language and uh, language, folklore and bio, uh, biodiversity and things like that. I'm interested in onomastic names and naming systems from uh, a Lua perspective. So I think that there's a lot of knowledge and that's why the couple from England agreed with them that we have a lot of work to be done and the younger scholars like my good friend Pete Angolo, I am over 60 myself, I don't know how old Peter is, uh, and the ones who are in their 20s should go deeper and do further scientific research. I don't, there's nothing like pseudoscience in this. What we have is et ethnoscience, ethnomedicine, ethnobotany. Ethno here referring to the culture of the people, and I am a supporter of indigenous knowledge systems. Uh, Dan at Chiromo and people like uh, the pe people like Dr. Peris Karioki of the museum, and my friend, uh, you know, the man who wrote a book on traditional food plants, not food crops, but food plants, so that we can protect some of the diminishing uh, diminishing uh, species, whether they are medicinal or whether they are nutritional or whether there are other uses for the survival of humanity. So I think we need to change our mentality. The paradigm must shift and we must go deeper and systematically study the natural resources, as you put it, plants, natural, uh, our biodiversity, especially the plants, which are useful as food for nutritional purposes and also for curative or medicinal purposes. Thank you. Thank you, Dak. Thank you, Prof. Thank you, thank you. Um, Rupi Mangat also had some additional questions. Thank you. Yeah. I totally agree with the speaker before me. I think it's absolutely necessary that we do acknowledge our own cultural uh, plants for medicine and that's where you know places like India um, if 30 years ago you said you were using Ayurvedic medicine you'd be like oh the poor person doesn't have money to go to a proper doctor but today Ayurvedic medicine is global there's such a big potential uh, for that so in the same way um, is there a potential for growth in your view, for ethno medicine, and then again, in view of emergence, emerging diseases like COVID, is there any research being done with herbal medicine to treat these diseases? And is there a lot of interest from government? Because again, going back to someplace like India, it's been emerging of government and traditional, I think, them supporting the Ayurvedic industry to go global. Do we need that here in Kenya too? Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. I think uh, all is not lost. And uh, in my own view, I think that uh, we needed to recognize this uh, traditional medicine and uh, elicit some interest so that the, especially the youth can, can uh, develop, can take into it and, uh, and, uh, and, and, uh, and, uh, and practice. Because that's where the gap is. We have the old who are dying and then we have the youths who are not interested in that. But uh, this is because uh, traditionally we have always uh, associated the tra traditional herbalist basically we have associated with them to with the maybe sorry to say either primitivity or uh, poverty so the youth sees that if this is this thing is associated with the poverty then why should i go i go into it so we need to elicit some interest so that uh, this uh, practice can uh, continue. 
Uh, the second question, sorry, I seem to have forgotten it. Well, um, in the face of emerging diseases like COVID, is there any research being done vis-a-vis -vis uh, herbal medicine? There are a lot of research. Let's say government funding, sorry. There are a lot of uh, research that are ongoing that is government funded through National Research Fund. Uh, not, ju not just on COVID, but also diseases like cancer and all that. Uh, I'm aware of the National Product Platform that is uh, based at the National Museums of Kenya that is currently doing a lot about uh, COVID, uh, working with the traditional herbalists uh, to see uh, if there is anything that can be done on COVID infection uh, based on traditional medicine. So yes, there's a lot that is uh, going on, but then uh, I think uh, what is missing is that uh, countries like China and India are ahead of us, whereby traditional medicine have been recognized and uh, have been uh, <clears throat> even in, been introduced in the mainstream medical healthcare. That is what is the missing. In Kenya, there is a, a missing link between the modern medicine and the traditional medicine, where they seem not to be working together. So I think uh, that is something that needs to be done. The government maybe need to look at we, into it so that uh, the two are brought together and we see uh, how far we can go. Thank you. Okay, thanks for that. I also see um, Najma Darani among the participants and she has also been responding to a number of questions. I would like to inform you that we also sell her, her title. There's one called Field Guide to Common Trees and Shrubs of East Africa that we currently have here at the Nature Kenya shop. It's quite informative that if you need it, you can just come and get it from our shop. I'll give her a chance to say a thing or two if she has something to say. Najma. Yeah, good afternoon, everybody. How are you? It was uh, really nice uh, and informative uh, talk uh, from the presenter. And um, yeah, I just wanted to say that um, I, I would like to add a little bit uh, from Professor Ojuang's um, some comments I want to give. And I agree with his uh, comments because uh, that not, not much is lost. The information uh, which we get is mostly from, uh, from, from the local communities whom we visit and still people have a lot of information about the plants and even the research which we are students are doing I'm, I'm teaching at the university Kenyatta University and so many students who, who are working in uh, uh, natural medicine and things they, they get a lot of information still from our uh, herbalists and uh, so uh, we cannot say that um, um, uh, the the information which they are giving is not right sometimes so some quite quite uh, quite a number of uh, herbalists who are quite uh, genuine also um yeah so uh, there's a lot to learn uh, for the young people uh, especially students and uh, researchers and there's a lot research needs to be done and a lot of research is going on uh, at, at the university level yeah from Nairobi University because uh, we uh, work uh, we collaborate with each other, with the Camry, with uh, ICRAF, with the uh, uh, Kenya, uh, Kenyatta University, Nairobi University, and a lot of students are working on uh, this uh, subject, actually. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Najma. We hope we also get a chance to, to you having a talk from you one day. Yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah. One day, yeah. So Peter, would you like to have some final words? I see that we're not, the questions are now all answered and let's now we have anybody remaining with a question. Yes, uh, Jack, I wanted to say something. Yes. Or to ask, eh? There is something I think I have also put there on the chat. First, thank you very much. That's a very interesting presentation. And uh, there is a question that was asked on how to utilize these plants. And I tie that with the, 
why the youth are not interested. Because as uh, the presenter has uh, put it, it seems like this information is somewhere up there. Uh, we are referred to the museum to come and see the books and to read and to ask questions. But how much of that information is down uh, where these plants are found? So that uh, once we can educate people on how to use it, like uh, the way you have just mentioned that Biden Spirosa, which is readily available, like now it's raining, it's all over the place, but we don't know how to use it, including myself. So if we don't know, we keep destroying and the interest also goes. So I wish we can be advised on where to get information on utilization and also on how now how to that information should get down to the people, even the youth we are talking about, maybe because the, the people you have said are old, I don't think they'll be able to do it now to transfer that information because the youth has moved so far. So maybe us who are doing uh, that research, eh, we should find a way of telling them how important a plant is so that we can all conserve. And the other thing I was wondering is, um, at this, uh, you have presented some photos, very nice photos on some plants. And I was wondering, uh, are these the only ones which have been registered in Kenya as being of uh, important cultural heritage? And I don't know whether cultural heritage, is it the same as uh, patenting? Because I'm wondering also how many of these plants have been patented? Because sometimes you lose some important uh, information because we have not patented it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh... The first question was, how do you bring in the youths? And I think uh, you've answered that, is uh, trying to get the youth involved, involved in what, uh, what we are doing. I was involved in ethnobotanical survey. We were trying to find out uh, those herbalists that uh, who are uh, engaged in the treatment of cancer. So we went all over the country, and it is a project that is still ongoing. And uh, we got some very interesting data on uh, the use of traditional uh, or medicinal plants in the treatment of cancer. Of, of cancer as, uh, although we were doing palliative care. So, uh, but uh, what I realized that most of these herbalists that we were talking to, they were very old was they? And even if you look at their uh, economic uh, status, is very, very, they are, they are the kind of, let me use the word poor. So I think this is what the, 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 the youth are seeing and seeing that they don't want to associate with them. So first of all, maybe we need to put this herbalist in their rightful, rightful place so that we can elicit some interest and also engage the youth in what we are doing so that we tell them the importance of this plant and the importance of keeping, uh, this kind of uh, information. Uh, cultural heritage and patenting are different things. They're not the same thing. Cultural heritage is just about uh, documenting, documenting our culture and all those, those. But when it comes to patent, patenting, that is a uh, totally different uh, aspects. I don't know how, med how many medicinal plants have been patented in Kenya. That information I don't have for now. Thank you. Okay, thanks a lot, Peter. Yeah, I think we have now tackled at least most of the questions. I think I, ha the, yeah. I have I have something very small. Yes. Just very small uh, it, as a response to Peter on youth and lack of interest. I think I think youth are interested. I teach, as I've told you, I teach on an anthropology program. And a lot of our anthropology students are interested in ethnomedicine. Uh, one of my students, a master student, is interested in uh, medicinal ethnobotany of the Tugen people of Baringo County, Kenya. Now, she's young, she's doing a master's degree, and uh, she's very keen. And there are two other students doing conservation Anthropology of Environmental Conservation, who are taking my course on ling uh, language and uh, biodiversity. They're also very keen, but I also do nature walk 
through the um, through the botanic garden all the way to to John Michuki John Michuki Park the newly uh, re refurbished place by the, uh, the courtesy minister for environment and forestry and I find different youth groups cleaning the place cleaning the river studying the trees so uh, they are informal groups and some of them have left school they're between high school and college so what we can do i talk as a member of staff at the university of nairobi one of us is a member of staff at kenyatta university some of us are are working with uh, some of us are working with the national museums of kenya i think these are institutions which can collaborate and push for mainstreaming of indigenous knowledge systems. How do we mainstream? Uh, my friend, Prof, uh, Dr. Oyeke, is a, is a trained educationist as well. So she knows what environmental studies or environmental activities are in lower school, lower primary schools, mid, uh, upper primary, secondary. So we let's catch them when they are young. That's, that, that's a good saying. Let's catch them when they're young. Let us involve Kenya Institute of Curriculum Development. Let us involve my friend Nabukwesi, the permanent secretary in charge of university education and research. Let him give us funds. Let us have, let us have seminars for primary school teachers, secondary school teachers. Let's revisit the curriculum, especially the new curriculum, the competency-based curriculum. My grandson is 10 years old and he, he tells me a lot of things that they do these things practically. So you must tell them this is Aniego, Bid and Spilosa. Let them know it when they are five years old or 10 years old. Let them grow with this knowledge because our grandparents learned through apprenticeship and socialization. So let us not blame anybody. We are in positions of power and influence and decision making at our level, you have done a great thing today. We have Nature Kenya. Nature Kenya has a big network in Kenya and in Uganda. Let's, let's do something and it can be done. So for me, I don't blame the youth. I think we have just not coordinated <laughs> our activities as institutions dealing with this very, very important area. Thank you. Sorry for giving a long, I thought it would be short, for giving a, a long comment on that. But yeah, I'm passionate about it. Thank you. Thank Professor, you I couldn't agree more with you. You really explicitly brought it out. We need to work on this thing. So we need some young brains like Peter to start us off to coordinate things for us. <laughs> Peter, challenge on you. That's challenge on me. I'll pick it up. Okay, <laughs> there's someone called Kelvin Ngeiwo. He has a, I'm a youth with keen interest in this. While doing tour guiding services at Elementaita region, this became an interest because majority of the old will freely share the knowledge. And I, um, and I imparted some to them to visitors. Prof, I couldn't agree more. So. I think he's agreeing that there's interest among the youth, which is very good for alluding to that. So any last words from our presenter, please, before we close? Uh, I think a lot have been said and the prof has given us a very good information. I just want to thank you for uh, attending this talk. And uh, just maybe just to mention, at the National Museum towards the Michuki Memorial Park, where Prof has mentioned, we have uh, started uh, ex situ conservation for medicinal plants that are used for cancer palliative care. It is a small garden that we started, it has not uh, been there for long maybe around uh, four, three months. So maybe uh, if you are interested, you can also visit and come and see 
uh, that uh, uh, garden. Maybe you'll get to uh, have more information about it. Otherwise, thank you very much and uh, God bless you all. Okay, thank you very much, Peter, for that very insightful talk that you have given us. And thank you to all our members for taking time to come and participate in this. I see a lot of interest in, uh, in yes. the medicinal plants and definitely we will be organizing more of such talks on plants to be specific. Yeah. Thank you very much and uh, have a restful weekend. Thanks. Thank you, Nature Kenya, for providing the platform. It was great. Okay, thank you, Elida. So we can give a few minutes for people to leave. Then we can just have a few words before you go, Peter. Okay. Anyway, so I've put everyone in the waiting room. They can leave slowly. <laughs> so it is just the three of us. Anyway, Asante, that was a very good talk. Actually, I'm also interested in these medicinal plants. So I think it was really, really good. And I saw a lot of interest from our members. Okay. So probably um, if you're able to try and also look within your research and see what more you can offer our members, always just feel free to let us know. Then we can always organize uh, a similar opportunity. Of course, not like in the next, uh, not in the next few months, at least we give it some time. We try to have different titles, like next week we have one for mammals and probably next month will be a different thing. But maybe when you see within your research and within the time that you have and you, you want to talk and share more knowledge, feel always feel free to get in touch with us. And how can I be attending your talk? <laughs> By becoming a member of Nature Kenya. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yes, we have different membership category. We have, I've, I've had some young environmentalists. Well, while you're giving the talk, I had some sounds of some young environmentalists around you. So we have the fa family category, which is 2,800 Kenya shillings, which, okay. takes, yeah, which takes care of somebody, their spouse, and at least two children. We and it's annual from the time you join until next year, April. So it's very right. really good. Then you'll be receiving a lot of information because we are a very active um, organization. Nature Kenya is very active. So every month you'll be getting a nature net. It has mm -hmm. information at least about our project, some of the conservation news. Yes, you'll be getting wow. it every month. Annually, you'll be getting a Kenya Birding magazine. It also has stories about birding, conservation, yes. And of course, okay, I know you are for the museum, but <laughs> okay, there's a benefit of free entry to the museum and museum sites. Yeah. And then we also have such talks that we normally organize monthly, but this month we have two, and next week we'll have one for mammals. So if you join immediately, we'll put you in our database and you start receiving the 
the information. Nice. Okay, then uh, I think I, I, I'll join and uh, so that I can be attending the, 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 the presentation. Ah, okay. Next so time, have, call, yeah. Next time, call me so that I can talk about the use of pesticides on uh, our uh, agricultural food. Ah, that's good. That's interesting. That is. That was my master's research. Yeah. And uh, maybe I can talk about it next time. Sour, sour. We'll call you. We'll try to look yeah. at our schedule and then we will we will now schedule you and inform you when you can do the talk. Yeah. Right. Thank you very much. So thanks. Richard will get in Thank touch you. with you to give you more information okay. about the membership. Asante. Okay. Thank you very much.